There are two particular types of leukemia that have been shown to have very clear mechanisms of abnormality, and we found out what they were, and there are drugs that fixed the problem, and they went from deadly to curable. The rest of the leukemia is not so good. They are very varied. There's a lot going on, and you remember people saying it's all in the genes. The problem is there are lots of genes that are very, very abnormal in the rest of the leukemias. And in order to crack those codes, there needs to be constant interaction between the bench scientists and the clinicians, which has actually been established incredibly effectively at Weill Cornell. The partnership between the bench and the bedside is in cracking the code of which genes are abnormal, what's going on, what's wrong with them, and how to use medications more effectively to target these particular abnormalities. We feel that we really are on the cusp of a new wave, and the personalized medicine that felt like Star Trek just a few years ago is actually becoming a reality, and we're working together to partner the clinicians and the basic scientists so that the cool stuff isn't just in the laboratory, and that we're actually able to bring patients in and in a very efficient way do genome sequencing and other types of highly complex uh, molecular biology tools and tests that were too expensive and too crazy just a few years ago are now becoming a reality. We had a very, very elderly patient in her late 80s, and nobody would do a bone marrow biopsy on her. She was very anemic and requiring a ton of transfusions, and she came to me for an additional opinion because nobody wanted to do a bone marrow test, which is really such a straightforward thing to do. And we did it, and we found out that she had what is called a 5Q problem. This is a specific chromosome that was abnormal, which has been shown to respond fantastically well to a pill. And we fixed her hemoglobin from, we, we made her from lying on the couch and not having any energy to do anything to being able to run around and feeling great with no transfusions just by doing the test. In the bone marrow disorders recently, there are things that we can do now. So first of all, for older patients, not getting a diagnosis because they're older is absurd. It makes no sense. We have to make sure that everybody at least gets a diagnosis because for some patients there are really things uh, to do that make a big difference. There are plenty of examples, and it's probably what keeps me going, of where there have been phenomenal advances, and certainly the areas of CML, or chronic myeloid leukemia, and APL are the ones that people know about because that's what's on the front page of the newspapers. These are among the cures in science and in cancer, and they're in every book about scientific discovery over the last 50 years. The problem is there's a lot more work to do, and in the rest of the leukemias and bone marrow problems, I can say specifically that at Weill Cornell, there has been an incredible partnership and a growing one between the bench and between the bedside. We are going to be the club to join. These are the people who are presenting the most exciting data at the most exciting clinical and basic science meetings, and we are together now in a team. We meet regularly. We discuss patients, we discuss science. We can look over and over again in the blood and in the bone marrow and keep checking how the disease is changing. And I think this is a fascinating point for scientists and clinicians to get together and in real time go back and forth between the bench and the bedside to figure out, are the medications working? Why are they working? Why are they not working? We can keep checking the disease, keep looking at the blood and the bone marrow over and over again in a way that's very different from any other disease. I think that in a floor or in an area of the new medical research building, there is a phenomenal opportunity to have everybody's brain lined up along the same hallway to really facilitate those interactions, sometimes the ones that are just off the cuff, random quick thoughts that may lead to phenomenal things. The team right now at Weill Cornell studying bone marrow diseases is really unparalleled, and we have put together a clinical trials army in such a way that there are trials for patients with pretty much whatever you've got in the realm of bone marrow diseases, and this includes newly diagnosed patients, relapsed patients, patients who need stem cell transplant. 
But in addition to that, every single clinical trial that we're working on, we are working to have a bench arm or a scientific correlative component in such a way that in a real-time manner, we're looking at what's happening with the new drug. Is it working? Is it not working? And most importantly, why? The molecular age is here, and molecular diagnostics in leukemia and in myelodysplastic syndromes have taken off and are already driving clinical practice. Tests that weren't even thought of just two or three years ago are now routine and driving decisions of how to get people onto clinical trials versus conventional treatments versus transplants. And what used to be thought of as just research tools, the patients now jump onto the internet and they come in with a sheet of which diagnostic tests they want and they ask me, are you going to sequence my genome? They know that it's close and in the same way as the iPhones came down in price pretty quickly, so are these sequencing tests and they are becoming much more readily available to the point that it's not just for the scientists, it's in the clinic already. We've gone from a time where patients were reluctant or concerned about um, participating in studies to asking and to wanting to do that. And what we need actually is the research infrastructure to be able to handle the demands for technology that are going to come with this because these tests aren't easy. They're very, very um, challenging. They require seasoned operators and people who know what they're doing and we want to be on the cutting edge of that. There is no doubt about it that the involvement of patients currently in their own care is a whole new era. And I can tell you that there have already been studies in which Craigslist and other internet um, access uh, points have been used to try to get patients um, onto studies. And one that just happened recently where patients were asked to donate blood and bone marrow, um, it got so such an overwhelming response that the investigators didn't even know what to do with the specimens. I just did a webinar last week for the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, and one of the questions that patients asked were, can I send you my marrow? Because they know that that's where discoveries are. There's no question about it that research does equal cures in the bone marrow diseases. And the bench to bedside, to back to the bench, to back to the bedside is what's important. There is not a one-way traffic. We really do run back and forth with observations of new drugs at the bedside and ask our colleagues in the laboratory, what, are the, what do they think this means? We really can say that research equals cures, especially in bone marrow diseases. And this has been shown already in the past and is definitely going to be the case in the future.